About 10 years ago, on a visit to South Africa, I was confronted by the issue of torture. It started when I went to Robben Island, where Nelson Mandela was held as a common prisoner for more than 20 years. Our guide, a former inmate who had been tortured, was less than wholly sane. He took us into the prison dormitory, where he was held at night, and slammed the door behind us, making people jump. That's how they slammed it on me, he cried. Once he had everyone inside, he gave a long and detailed account of his torture, of having his body bound in chains and being dropped from a height onto a concrete floor, of having his genitals savaged by an Alsatian. At the end of the tour, he walked away from us, crying, a wild jumble of emotion. By then we had passed the tiny cell where Nelson Mandela sat, conceiving the path whereby South Africa could avoid civil war. As I understand it, the principle Mandela worked on is just about the opposite to torture. Mandela said that if you treat people as if they possess integrity, and that includes your prison guards, eventually they have to treat you in the same manner. I was in South Africa attending a conference on the media. I met a lot of journalists of different races and different nationalities who'd been to prison for their belief in journalism. I met a radio journalist from Zimbabwe whose radio station had been blown up once by the Mugabe government. What keeps you going, I asked him. The people, he said, the people support us. Then I met an onlooker at the conference I'll call Stephen, which is not his name, but he has family in Zimbabwe and he was tortured there. A black man tortured by black men. I ended up going home with him and meeting his family. I played cricket with Stephen and his kids in the backyard. It was Africa at evening, lush and magnificent. Here I was playing backyard cricket, backyard cricket being, to me, an image of Australian innocence, with a man who had been tortured, hurt horribly in a sustained and deliberate manner by a vicious, paranoid regime. There was no politics of race here. None of the 21st century's moral relativities applied. I was confronted by plain, old-fashioned evil. My friend Stephen, a small man, is a moral mountain who turned his back on the armed struggle to work for social change in nonviolent ways. I will tell you one small story about Stephen. He ran me to the airport when I left. I'd lost my ticket. All I had was a piece of paper with the name and number of a Qantas official in another city. I handed over the piece of paper. The man I handed it to disappeared and suddenly I had no way of getting home. Then on the other side of the airport, the man from behind the counter reappeared, my piece of paper in his hand, hurrying about his duties. I said I was going over to tell him to make sure he didn't lose the piece of paper, but Stephen said, trust him, sometimes it's better. And it was. I got home and a certain good spirit had been preserved. But at the airport, Stephen also said to me of his torturers, they did terrible things to me. And I saw the fire of a pain that would never be extinguished and knew that torture is an insult to whatever it means to be human. The next part of the story happens back here in Australia shortly afterwards, when I happened to turn to the back cover of my favourite literary periodical, the New York Review of Books. That is where the most eminent of the books of the day are advertised. There, alongside one on Louisiana dance music and another on the history of Latin as a language, was a book titled Torture, in which, quote, social experts discussed the advisability of maintaining an absolute ban on torture. Suddenly, it seemed to me, torture was a subject for polite discussion, like Louisiana dance music or the history of Latin as a language. Why? One answer was because it was a discussion being conducted among so-called social experts. You show me a social attitude or practice, I'll find you a social expert who will justify it. Not long afterwards, two Australian academics from Deakin University published a paper in an American magazine arguing for the ethical validity of torture. Faced with a backlash here in Australia, one of them, I seem to recall, 
said the discussion of torture in America was, quote, more rational. Various polls in the United States over the previous three years had found majority support for the use of torture in certain circumstances. I hereby assert what I believe to be a general rule of human nature. People who approve of torture in opinion polls do so in the confidence that they are not the ones who are going to be tortured. In my increasingly eccentric sports column, I asked the question, because no one else would, what treatment did the Australian government expect Australian soldiers would receive when next taken prisoner in an Asian or Middle East war, now that we have Guantanamo Bay as a precedent? I asked as the son of a man who was lucky to survive being used as a slave labourer on the Burma Railway. And so, in response to the book advertisement on the back page of the New York Review of Books, I wrote an essay on torture, which I was fortunate to get published, initially in The Age, later in an international collection. My friend Stephen helped me, singing me home when I read it to him. Oh, Martin, Martin, Martin. The essay started, quote, torture, to me the most repugnant of human practices, is back in intellectual fashion. It ended, the arguments for torture haven't really changed since the Inquisition. What has changed is what's terrifying us and who we suspect its agents among us to be. And so I made my statement. But it was what happened next that really scared me. What happened? Nothing. Nothing happened. Well, that's not exactly right. Four Supreme Court judges from Victoria and South Australia contacted me and said it was an important article. Then I went to see former Liberal Prime Minister Malcolm Fraser about another matter. When I entered his office, I saw my essay on his desk. Your essay's good, he said in his clipped, curt way, but I think it's too late. My past exchanges with Fraser had taught me to respect the voluminous cavern of his brain and the amount of knowledge he could store in it. He knew about torture all right, about the chain of command from Abu Ghraib, about the rendition program, about the definition proffered by Alberto Gonzalez, President Bush's legal counsel, that to qualify as torture, the pain had to cause serious physical injury, organ failure or death. Fraser said, quote, if we embrace the methods and techniques of tyrants, we take a significant step towards becoming like them. That is the central dilemma our leaders have not resolved. It was a dark time. It seemed to me that most Australians were either not aware or didn't care that torture was becoming an idea of our time, like four-wheel drives and problems with the weather. It further seemed to me that if people were not aware torture was insinuating its way back into our public life, there would be no resistance to the idea. In my essay against torture, I noted that in America, in the period before the Civil War, to be passionately against slavery was to risk being described as, quote, morbidly anti-slavery. Mark Twain said his mother was a church-going Christian all her life, and never heard a single sermon against slavery from the pulpit. I have long been a believer in the poet T.S. Eliot's dictum that humankind cannot bear too much reality. I spiraled down into a dark place. What finally gave me strength was stumbling across a history of the British anti-slavery movement, Bury the Chains, by Adam Hochschild. The anti-slavery movement is the great social struggle of the past 200 years in Britain and therefore for us in this country. So much has flowed from it, not least a new idea of politics. In the words of one of slavery's defenders, Lord Abingdon, quote, humanity is a private feeling and not a public principle to act upon. It is from the defeat of the slave trade that the great reform movement of the 19th century springs and with it the belief that politics is a mechanism whereby we can progress morally as a society. It is amazing to think that a little over 200 years ago, Britain was the biggest international trafficker in slaves, 
that the wealth of its great ports and colonies and the prestige of its navy was insidiously tied to the trade so that slavery's champions would include the great military hero of the day, Horatio Nelson, and the Duke of Clarence, later William IV, King of Great Britain. Nor was it merely the case that the slave owners and traffickers were the most powerful political lobby in the land. They owned whole blocks of seats in the parliament. The odds against those who decided the slave trade must be actively opposed could not have been greater. They faced a blanket of national apathy. Wealth, power and connections were against them. But men and women stood up, a few at first and then in numbers. The story of one of those people, Thomas Clarkson, was profoundly moving to me. The background to the story of Thomas Clarkson was that in 1782, four years after Captain Cook saw our shores, the captain of a Liverpool ship called the Zong threw 132 sick slaves overboard and then entered an insurance claim on the basis that they qualified as perished cargo. The Chief Justice, Lord Mansfield, said there was no issue of murder. It was, quote, just as if horses were killed. That is, it was a property matter. However, the case disturbed a prominent Anglican clergyman who was subsequently elected to a professorship at Cambridge where he was required to set the essay topic for the university's Latin prize. The subject he set was, is it lawful to make others slaves against their will? The prize was won by a young man named Thomas Clarkson, who argued that slavery was immoral. However, having completed the academic exercise, Clarkson found himself haunted by what he had written. Eventually, in the course of writing to London to begin a career in the church, he was so overwhelmed that he dismounted at Wade's Mill in Hertfordshire and, quote, sat down disconsolate. There the thought came to him that, quote, if the contents of the essay were true, it were time that some person should see these calamities to their end, unquote. He then knew no one in the world who thought as he did. William Wilberforce became the voice of the British anti-slavery movement, but Thomas Clarkson was its backbone. And one of the reasons for the success of the British anti-slavery movement is that it did indeed become a movement. For the first time in British political history, people campaigned for the political rights of others and not themselves. In my moments of despair about the world, such as I had when confronted with torture, I go back to the British anti-slavery movement. They fought, bigger odds that, than, that they fought bigger odds than we face now, and they won. As for torture, I believe there is an ugliness in it that surpasses all other human ugliness, even in my opinion, the death penalty. It is a deliberate act so dark it would literally take a Christ to forgive it. And while I have long known that torture existed in the world, I never thought it would touch me in any way. And when it did, even though it was only as an observer and then from a distance, I saw what torture sufferers everywhere must know, how little their plight and suffering is understood or even acknowledged by the world, and how that in turn must exacerbate their agony. And what I also know is that as a human possibility, Torture is never far away. In fact, the Republican nominee for the presidency of the United States of America, Donald Trump, has just endorsed its use. There is a battle to be fought. There is always a battle to be fought. <laughs>